Hello, my name is Victor Krauthammer, and today's topic is going to be on the FDA regulation of medical devices, or what you need to know about how to either market or research your device in humans. Uh, everything I say today is in the public domain. All of my sources are public, and you're free to use this for any non-commercial reason you, you'd like to. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, again, my name is Victor Krauthammer. Uh, I have a PhD degree in neuroscience from uh, the University at Buffalo in New York. Uh, and I've done postdoctoral work in neurophysiology at New York Medical College. And I've been on the faculty at a few institutions, uh, permanently at uh, uh, Nova Southeastern University, uh, that, that was uh, over 30 years ago, and now most recently at uh, the George Washington University in biomedical engineering. Most importantly, I spent uh, 30 years uh, working at FDA in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, and I've become familiar with most of the processes involved in the regulation of medical devices through those years of experience. The learning objectives for today are, are relatively simple. There are two main ones. The first is to gain a basic knowledge of medical device regulation, uh, just to appreciate what's there. Uh, and the second part is uh, to develop uh, a way of navigating FDA regulations and information so that you can approach your own problems uh, through FDA and other databases uh, so, uh, so that you're, you're prepared uh, for um, anything that comes along as far as, uh, as, as far as federal regulations of medical devices. So that, that second part's very important, is to uh, find where to look. Uh, specifically, we'll review today what FDA does, uh, what FDA doesn't do, and uh, very simply, FDA doesn't regulate the practice of medicine. FDA regulates products. Um, what is a medical device? Um, what are the different classes of medical device? And those are risk-based classes. Uh, devices are regulated differently according to the level of risk. Um, some of the terminology, what does it mean to be approved by FDA, cleared by FDA, exempt from FDA. So th th these are all terms you hear commonly uh, and they have uh, specific meanings within FDA. Um, and we'll go through the most common route of review in FDA, which is also known as the 510K or pre-market notification. Um, and this is uh, where most of the devices are reviewed in FDA. We'll also uh, go through uh, pre-market approval uh, which is for the higher risk devices, the class three devices. Uh, and that's uh, a little more unusual, but, uh, but there are many uh, breakthrough devices and important devices that have gone through uh, that, that route of pre-market approval. Uh, we'll also go through how to do human research with medical devices. There are specific regulations related to that. Um, requirements for reporting, so once your device is on the market, um, no matter how it gets to the market, uh, you still require to report adverse events, and we'll go through that. Um, and then, most importantly, how to prepare for FDA. Um, we'll, we'll just go through uh, what, what to search and uh, what, what to look for as you prepare for FDA. So in terms of uh, uh, the first topic, um, this is an introductory topic. It's about FDA's mission and structure. Uh, FDA's mission can be simply summarized as safety and effective, effectiveness. Uh, it's a consumer protection uh, agency in the federal government. And it's, it's probably the premier consumer protection uh, uh, part for, uh, for the war, in the world for, uh, for uh, medical products. Uh, there's an important public health mission, uh, the regulatory part of, uh, of what FDA regulates is uh, public health. FDA, by law, is science-based, so it's not based. Uh, it's not supposed to be based on uh, on political whims or uh, or uh, uh, other factors that can enter into public life. Uh, FDA more recently has been charged with also facilitating innovation, and that's led to a few programs we'll talk about today. 
Um, FDA also communicates with the public, especially about drugs, medical devices, and um, you know, most recently, a lot about vaccines. And uh, lastly, uh, FDA does not interfere with the practice of medicine, so it doesn't get in the way of the doctor-patient or physician-patient relationship. If we look carefully at the FDA mission statement, safety and efficacy are, are the primary part of it. Um, and uh, it includes uh, foods, drugs, uh, veterinary products, biological products, medical devices, uh, cosmetics, and any products that emit radiation. Uh, FDA is also uh, responsible for advancing public health by helping to speed innovation. So uh, the, these are the primary parts of the FDA mission. And uh, the FDA, uh, to accomplish this mission, F the FDA is divided into different centers. Um, there's this organizational chart shows uh, uh, the commissioner um, right now, uh, Janet Woodcock is the acting commissioner. Um, and. Uh, you know, the number of employees at FDA, uh, close to 18,000. Um, and then there are different office, different centers. Um, there's, uh, and the centers are product-based. And the, these are the parts that actually do the, um, the regulation of what comes out onto the market. Uh, the largest center uh, shown here is uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research with uh, over 5,000 employees. So um, all of the drugs go through a uh, approval pathway uh, and uh, that's all done within the Center for Drugs, Drug Evaluation and Research. The second largest, largest center is for devices, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And that includes all medical devices and radiation emitting products. Uh, the next center uh, is the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Um, here, uh, biologics are uh, evaluated and put on the market. And biologics include vaccines. So all of the uh, authorizations that happened recently and investigations of COVID vaccines uh, were through the center. And there are only uh, fewer than 1,200 employees to the center. It's um, uh, relatively small, but of course, uh, like all the other centers, carries a lot of impact and weight. Uh, there's a Center for Food Safety and Nutrition, also with about 1,000 employees, uh, regulating uh, uh, processed foods, uh, seafoods, and also cosmetics uh, and nutritional supplements. Uh, all within that center. There's a Center for Veterinary Medical Products, a uh, Center for Veterinary Medicine, um, and that's one of the smaller centers, but it regulates um, any drugs or foods that animal get. Um, and they're especially concerned with things that go into agricultural animals, thing, foods and um, drugs that may end up in the, in the human food chain. Uh, and uh, last of all is the uh, Center for Tobacco Products, which uh, uh, re regulates, as the name implies, tobacco products, including um, e-cigarettes. Uh, so the, these are the outward-facing product-based cent centers. There's also a large, um, what's called an office, Office of Regulatory Affairs, with almost 5,000 people. Uh, this uh, office is the, basically the field office, the place where inspections occur. Uh, they're located in all states, um, and there are many international uh, offices. I believe there are at least two right now in China because uh, uh, drugs are being produced in China that are sold in the U.S., so um, the inspections do go, go on uh, in foreign countries as, as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and they also uh, are responsible for enforcement of, uh, of uh, all the regulations, all the laws and regulations. Okay, so uh, we, at the end of each session, we're going to do a uh, brief quiz, so uh, just to make sure we're all on, on the same page. 
Um, anyway, the first question is, which two of the following are part of the FDA mission? A, approving a device for over-the-counter sales. B, comparing the effectiveness of different treatments. C, assume, assuring safety of municipal drinking water supplies. Or D, patient safety during clinical trials. So which two of those are part of the FDA mission? Question two, which of the following products is not regulated by FDA? Prescription drugs, prosthetic limbs, food additives, stem cell therapies, or pesticides? And here's a summary of uh, what we spoke about. So um, F FDA regulates foods, drugs, medical devices, and radiation emitting products, biologics, veterinary products, and tobacco products. And the structure of the FDA fits these or th this, these functions. And it's organized by centing centers according to product types. Um, and uh, medical devices and radiological emi radiation emitting products are regulated by the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And uh, if you were to add up what FDA regulates with uh, fewer than 20,000 employees, FDA regulates about a quarter of the U.S. economy. Uh, so that's uh, a pretty big, pretty big impact organization, especially for the size of it. This is topic two, and it is what is a medical device and how CDRH organizes itself and functions in the regulation of medical devices. So we'll first start off with the de definition of what a medical device is uh, and what it isn't. Uh, one of the things it isn't, and we'll discuss briefly, is uh, uh, something that affects general wellness. Uh, something like uh, overall mood or overall well-being. Uh, we'll also talk about combination products. There are products that are part device, part drug, for example. Um, we'll go into some detail on the organization of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health and uh, go through the uh, various offices uh, that are broken down by uh, product specialty, by basically by medical specialties. So, uh, first of all, the first thing you want to know is your product a medical device? Um, and there's uh, some legal definitions, uh, and uh, the main one is that it's intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, or in the cure, mitigation, treatment or prevention of disease in man or other animals. So, uh, so there's some key words here. Um, intended use, so it has to be intended to diagnose a disease or treat a disease or other condition. Um, and, uh, it, it, or, or prevent a disease. Um, also, it, if it's a product, and this is to distinguish a device from drugs, if it's attended, intended to affect the structure or function of the body uh, and doesn't achieve its intended purposes through chemical action, it's also a, a device. So uh, devices uh, are important to repeat. Again, the intended use has to be uh, related to uh, the diagnosis or uh, treatment of diseases or other conditions. Um, and uh, also would have to affect the structure uh, and, or, or any function of the body. Uh, getting into an area that we're, that's not, not a device are things that are for general wellness. Uh, products for general wellness, first of all, have to be safe. Um, they, they can't be dangerous. Uh, they have to be safe uh, and they have to be uh, intended uh, to be used for general wellness rather than for the diagnosis or treatment of diseases. Um, so something like weight management um, is a general wellness claim. Uh, physical fitness is a uh, general wellness claim. Uh, of course, recre recreation, but also relaxation or stress management. So there, uh, the, uh, the, the border gets a little fuzzy. Uh, if 
if a product is designed to relieve anxiety, anxiety is a medical condition, so that would be a device. If it's uh, there to uh, improve relaxation or to manage stress, that's not a medical claim, and therefore it won't be a medical device. Uh, mental acuity, we see a lot of things in the uh, uh, gaming industry uh, that are supposed to improve mental acuity. That's not a medical device if it, if it is safe. Uh, Self-esteem, um, uh, so things, devices that may uh, you know, alter a cosmetic function. Uh, also, uh, devices involved in sleep management. Again, there's a gray area there because uh, uh, insomnia or sleep apnea are definitely medical diagnoses, which would throw that those products into devices. But to improve uh, sleep management or quality of sleep, uh, that uh, probably would not be a medical device. Uh, so, uh, so there's this general uh, sustaining or offering of general improvement of functions associated with a general state of health. Um, so those products are, uh, are, are not regulated by FDA. Of course, FDA is able to step in if, uh, if those products or their advertising um, goes beyond uh, general wellness over towards uh, treating medical conditions or diseases. Uh, Combination products are an interesting category, and we'll talk about it a little bit here. Uh, uh, combination products, I'll, I'll give some examples. Uh, a drug eluding stent is a combination product. Uh, an asthma inhaler is a combination product. Um, injectors with drugs in them are combination products. Uh, even a closed loop insulin delivery system is a combination product. Uh, containing both device and drug. Uh, and the determination uh, of, uh, well, first of all, uh, combination products are regulated by their primary centers where, where the interaction um, is, is the most salient. So if something is, uh, if the issues relate mainly to drug interactions, then that product would be uh, regulated by the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. So by example, and the examples I've given you, so a drug eluding stent, since its main action is to hold a vessel open, a physical means of holding a vessel open, uh, and the drug part is, uh, is supposed to be from, uh, uh, to prevent uh, tissue growth or, uh, or, or, or clogging of that stent, the, the main action is holding uh, the, the vessel open and CDRH uh, regulates uh, drug eluding stents. Uh, asthma inhalers will often, uh, they might you know, uh, contain a uh, beta agonist, a beta adrenergic agonist, and there the primary mechanism uh, is drugs. And that, so asthma inhalers are, even though there's a physical delivery system, the main effect is the drugs, and that would be uh, regulated by CDR. Um, any sort of injector, uh, be it ultrasound or iontophoresis or needles, without the drug in it is a medical device and that's uh, regulated by CDRH. Uh, the injector with the drug supplied, there again the, the primary mechanism of action would be the drug. So, uh, 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 so you know, uh, for example, uh, a uh, syringe that comes with a uh, drug in it would be regulated by CEDAR. Um, and last uh, is, is a recent uh, device that we, we saw, I kind of gave it away, but the closed loop uh, insulin de delivery system, uh, the artificial pancreas. Uh, there it's the insulin that's having the effect, but uh, somewhat exceptionally, CDRH uh, regulates uh, these artificial pancreases. Uh, and that's because uh, uh, the, the biology of insulin is, is, is fairly well known, um, and the, the main products that are of concern are the, uh, the regulation of the detection of the glucose and the uh, delivery of insulin, which, uh, of course, can be um, very dangerous. So um, the Office of Combination Products decided that CDRH should uh, regulate the artificial pancreas.
But if you have any questions or you want feedback, um, there, I put a, a website um, and there's a form you can fill out and uh, request uh, the uh, Center for Combination Products, the Office of Combination Products, uh, to uh, uh, give an opinion on where your product would be regulated. And, uh, I, and I've been talking about laws and regulations um, and um, you know, Congress will pass a law, the president will sign the law, uh, and these laws are written up into regulations in the Code of Fe Federal Regulations, and agencies use the regulations. So I encourage you, um, whatever product you're working on, to look at the Code of Federal Regulations and how it relates to your product. Um, the laws are changed into regulations, but also agencies can propose new regulations. Uh, for example, if you have a new type of device, um, FDA, uh, if you, you granted a uh, what's called a de novo or something new request, uh, you get a new regulation with that device, um, and uh, that regulation goes into the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, and uh, when FDA pr proposes a new regulation, that's uh, noted in the Federal Register, and there's always a uh, public comment period, and it's uh, it's a way of uh, for the FDA to get uh, public impact, public comment on the impacts of what they're doing, um, and uh, the regulations cover the marketing of devices, so it goes through uh, PMA 510Ks, de novo, and humanitarian device exemption. Uh, as well as uh, experimenting with devices, so the regulations also cover IDEs, or investigational device exemptions. Uh, there are over 6,500 generic types of devices, and FDA assigns a three-letter pro product code to each of those devices. Uh, there are 16 medical specialties that roughly map onto the medical specialties you're used to, uh, something like ophthalmology or neurology or uh, uh, pulmonology. Those are obstetrics, gynecology. Those are the kinds of medical specialty panels that exist in FDA. There are three regulatory classes. We'll talk about that more. And the classes are based on risk. Um, the risk has to do with the intended use um, which is the general purpose of the device. So an intended use may be to, uh, you know, to treat back pain. An indication for use, that usually involves a specific medical condition. So it, it might be, um, you know, back pain from uh, nerve uh, impairment, from, from uh, uh, nerve pressure. Um, and the risk opposed to the patient or user. So, uh, so devices are classified according to um, the risk uh, based on indications and intended use. Uh, the center itself has uh, uh, a number of offices. Um, the offices, the outward facing office that regulates products where if you're uh, dealing with a new product, uh, you'll be uh, working with this uh, office. It's the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality, OPEQ. Um, there are other offices. Um, the office I spent most of my time in was the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, which is a laboratory research-based office. Um, there's also an Office of Communication and Education where you can get information about uh, CDRH. So that's, that's another useful office um, to know about. And also, uh, and we'll talk about this at the end, if you ever want to partner with FDA on anything, there's an Office of Strategic Partnership and Technology. Um, so that's uh, an another place that you may want to uh, look into. Uh, but as far as the regulatory part, it's this Office of Product Evaluation and Quality uh, where you want to uh, uh, pay attention to. And if you look in detail at that office, there are, uh, there are uh, seven different sub-offices, uh, depending on the type of device and medical specialty. Uh, the first one is ophthalmic anesthesiology, respiratory, ear, nose, and throat, and dental devices. It's a large uh, conglomeration, all 
controlled in one office, um, or as we call it, a super office, um, office of cardiovascular devices, uh, that uh, speaks for itself, office of gastrointestinal OBGYN, general hospital and urology devices, uh, and, and so on. Um, there's, uh, uh, this is a neurotechnology course, so there's an office of neurological and physical medicine devices. Um, and there's also an office of in vitro diagnostics and radiological health. And that's where most of the uh, neural imaging things are regulated. And, uh, and I mentioned earlier that FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine. And uh, that, that's true for devices as well as for drugs. So uh, uh, FDA uh, regulates the commercial entities involved in products. Uh, so it shouldn't affect the ability of a healthcare practitioner to prescribe or administer, administer any legally marketed device or, or drug or any other thing that's legally marketed for a condition or disease uh, within a legitimate uh, patient healthcare practitioner uh, relationship. So uh, that, that's basically saying if, uh, if FDA approves a device with a certain label, um, a physician or practitioner is free to prescribe uh, that device for something else. And that's what's called off-label use. Um, there aren't good data on off-label device use. Um, there is, are some better data uh, on off-label drug use, especially in the neurological area. So uh, uh, the prov province of Quebec in Canada uh, did a study of uh, how many uh, neurological drugs uh, are, are given off use. Uh, and in, in Canada, it turns out that uh, over a quarter of all uh, primary care prescriptions of neurological drugs are off use. So something like uh, an anticonvulsant, um, which you, you think would which was approved for seizure disorder, um, can also be used as, as it is now for bipolar disorder. So that's an off-label use. Um, antidepressants can be used for anti-anxiety, um, different, slightly different labeling. Uh, but FDA does not uh, uh, weigh in at all on how uh, physicians or practitioners use what's legally mar marketed. But we, we don't know how much off-label use, we, we have anecdotes of off-label use, but we truly don't know how much off-label use there is for medical devices. So um, here are some questions. Um, number three, this is, uh, you, you have to think about this a little bit. Uh, an adult diaper labeled for incontinence is a medical device, whereas an infant diaper is not a medical device. Is that true or false? Next question. A phrenic nerve stimulator for respiration would be regulated, regulated by the office of A, ophthalmic anesthesia, respiratory, ENT, and dental devices, B, cardiovascular devices, C, surgical and infection control devices, or D, neurological and physical medicine devices. Five is also true false. A video game that claims to relax and focus the mind is a medical device. Is that true or false? And uh, in summary, uh, medical devices uh, are defined by law as uh, uh, by their intended use and having non-chemical action. Uh, the Code of Federal Regulation defines the uh, regulatory practices and individual devices. And it's a good place, the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, is a good place to look when you're first uh, starting to uh, consider how you're, you're going to uh, get your device to market. And uh, CDRH offices uh, reflect uh, medical specialties and device functions by indication. 
and you should get to know which office um, your device would be regulated by. Okay, this is topic three and it has to do with the categorization of medical devices and the level of risk and these three different levels of risks are used to regulate devices. So uh, first of all we have what's called class one devices and these are the lowest risk devices. Uh, so something like a band-aid would be a class one medical device. Uh, an artificial hand, a prosthetic hand uh, that has uh, that's there for cosmetics. It's it's just a uh, non-movable hand. Would also be a class one medical device. And these devices are uh, subject to what are called general controls. So um, they're uh, th they have to be manufactured well. They have to be labeled. Um, and uh, another general control is if there's an adverse event that happens uh, with the device, it has to be reported to the FDA. Um, and these are the lowest risk devices and almost all uh, class one devices are exempt from FDA review. They're not exempt from regulation, uh, just uh, review. So you still need uh, to follow the, uh, the general controls that are needed for that device. Uh, another example is a gauze pad, and one of the general controls is that it has to be uh, sterile. Uh, the class two devices are medium risk devices. Um, these are devices that can be dangerous, but with the right type of controls, uh, they're not dangerous. Uh, a good example is always an, an x-ray machine. An x-ray machine potentially can be dangerous, but with the right type of circuitry and, and safeguards in the device, um, it could be made uh, relatively safe. So um, and th these are the medium risk devices. And uh, these are the class two devices. And most uh, devices that are reviewed uh, by FDA that are on the market are class two devices. And we'll, we'll go through several of them today. Uh, the class three are the highest risk devices. Uh, this is where pre-market approval applications needed where you need uh, to uh, have data that show the device um, provides a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. Uh, and just so generally, uh, there's uh, clinical evidence associated uh, with the pre-market approval process. And most often it's a uh, randomized uh, study and uh, very often a, a randomized control study. Uh, there are also user fees, and user fees, of course, vary by the uh, class of the device. Um, we'll also distinguish approval, clearance, and, and exemptions, um, and uh, look at a website, and it, the web address is on the slide, uh, for how to classify your own device. And most devices, as I said, there are 6,500 devices, and most of them um, have already been classified. So here um, are the different class devices. So uh, most, as I said, most class one devices uh, are exempt. A uh, company in class one still needs to register their company and list it with FDA. Um, and they have to follow general controls. So if you have, let's say, a walker, a walker that supports people. It has to be strong enough. It has to be built uh, according to the right standards so, so that it is uh, reliable. Uh, there are a few class one devices that are not exempt uh, that need to be reviewed by FDA. Uh, mechanical wheelchairs are class one, but they're, they're not exempt. Uh, most class two devices aren't exempt. So uh, here we show a uh, robotic arm that could be used as a prosthetic arm. Uh, that's a, uh, example of, another example of a class two device. And uh, class three, uh, my favorite one is, uh, is the cochlear implant, uh, which is implanted and, uh, and has a long history of uh, fairly good clinical studies of, um, of what benefits what the benefits and risks are for these devices. So th those, those are the uh, 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 classifications of the devices. Um, 
uh, if we look at the pathway uh, to market uh, for the class two devices, the 510K pathway, which we'll discuss, pre a pre-market notification or, uh, in 2019, um, there were almost 3,000 such uh, devices uh, cleared for marketing. There were 22 uh, that went through a de novo process where special controls were written. They, that didn't exist before. Uh, for class three devices, there were only 32, less, less than 1% or about one, sorry, just over 1% um, for pre-market uh, approval application. And three that received a humanitarian device exemption and that's for a condition affecting fewer than 8,000 people in, in the United States. Um, briefly, the, uh, the HDE measures safety um, and probable benefit rather than, uh, than, than, than effectiveness, which is what the PMA measures. Many people are surprised by this slide. Um, it was done by the Congressional Research Services. Um, it shows uh, that 63% of the devices that are on the market are exempt from FDA uh, review. Uh, that's, uh, and many people are astounded by that. So the, these are primarily class one device. And, you, and if you think about it, things like tongue depressors, band-aids, uh, uh, lo lots, lot, lots of devices uh, that, that you can find in a, in a drugstore are exempt. Um, and that's 63% of all medical devices. Uh, roughly 35% are in class two, and these are reviewed by FDA and make up the majority of those reviewed by FDA. Uh, and uh, PMAs are about 1%, or, uh, so the class three devices are about 1%. Uh, there's an additional 1% that, probably, that covers uh, de novo and um, HDEs. So you, you can see, and many people are surprised uh, by, by this uh, chart. And what does it mean to be um, these words like approved, cleared, authorized, exempted, or listed? Um, FDA approved for a medical device means that there's been a PMA approval. That's the technical use of the word approved. Cleared refers to the 510K. In, in, in um, pre-market notification, FDA clears a device when it's substantially equivalent uh, to an, another device. Or granted, it applies to de novo, where you have a class two device that's not substantially equivalent, but you develop special controls uh, that affect safety and effectiveness. Uh, there are exempted devices. Um, there, there are some exemptions that FDA reviews, most notably uh, the investigational device exemption. So you can uh, use your device experimentally and even sell it for experimental use uh, with an investigational device exemption. Uh, a humanitarian device exemption is also reviewed by FDA. Um, there are also exempted devices that we spoke about before, the class one devices, FDA doesn't review them, uh, but um, th these are almost all uh, class one devices. And there are several uh, indications in class two devices that are exempted from uh, pre-market notification. Uh, and companies very often call this FDA listed. Uh, uh, and uh, there are authorized devices as well. There was uh, emergency use authorization of uh, different COVID tests, for example. Uh, so this, this is something that's authorized for FDA but doesn't fall into these other categories. And uh, if we look at the overall path, we have a uh, picture that, w that uh, Dr. Welly, who's uh, uh, one of the leaders of the course, back in 2012, um, kind of mapped, and she was the first to actually map how uh, the uh, pattern of how devices approved. So we have on the top class one, class two, and class three devices, uh, exemption being one, and going down, you see the path to market exemption for class one devices. Uh, some class two devices are exempt. 
but most go through uh, uh, pre-market uh, notification, the 510K process. Um, there's de novo, um, which uh, uh, as assigns uh, a regulation to a new uh, class two device. Um, then there's humanitarian device exemptions and pre-market approval. And, uh, so, and you can see the, the, these different pathways to approval, to getting to the market. And you can see uh, the types of controls looking across uh, horizontally. There's general controls apply to all devices. Special controls uh, apply to class two and uh, often class three devices. And clinical data is always uh, applies to class three uh, devices. And if we look at user fees, you can see uh, how much FDA charges. Um, and the difference is, is quite large. So uh, if you're a big company and want to file a pre-market approval application, it's uh, $366,000. Uh, if you're a small company, and that's defined uh, in the law, uh, small companies pay $91,000. For common things like 510Ks, um, a, a 510K is 12,000 for a um, large company and 3,000 uh, for a small company. Uh, and you can see the numbers, again, reflecting the uh, prevalence of the devices, where the uh, PMAs, there were only uh, uh, four, 43 uh, PMAs uh, on average per year, um, over 30, 3,800 uh, 510Ks average per year, and 27,000 device registrations. All companies have to register, but the large majority of these are the companies that make uh, the Class 1 devices, that, and they have to pay uh, a, um, a fee for registering. So for the questions, um, which one of the following is true for class one medical devices? A, malfunctions that cause injury are exempt from reporting to FDA. B, are generally exempt from 510K clearance. C, are exempt from labeling requirements for medical devices. D, firms are exempt from FDA registration or E, are not regulated by FDA. So which of these is true for the class one device? The most common path to market of class two devices is prospective clinical trials for safety and effectiveness, laboratory testing in animals, proof of safety but not effectiveness, substantial equivalence to a predicate device already on the market. And in this section, we reviewed the classification of medical devices according to risk. It's essential uh, to know what uh, class your medical device is in. Um, and FDA can actually help you with that if, if you're uncertain. You can, uh, um, you can file such a request uh, with FDA. Uh, this is topic four. And it has to do with the most prevalent type of FDA review done for devices, the 510K or pre-market notification. And this applies to class two devices and a, and a very small minority of class one devices as well. Uh, but the idea of 510K is to look for a substantial equivalence to a predicate device. Uh, and substantial equivalence is determined by intended use and by technology. Uh, and uh, for technology, uh, if a technology is different and there are no new questions affecting safety and effectiveness, uh, then a device can be found substantially equivalent. If, of course, the device is almost a duplicate or a Me Too device, then it, it almost certainly would be uh, substantially equivalent. Uh, substantial equivalence also uses standards, um, and, uh, and these are recognized industry standards uh, that FDA has uh, recognized. Uh, 
And there are different types of 510Ks, traditional, special and abbreviated, um, and a, a new performance pathway, which is part of the abbreviated, it uses performance-based uh, standards or performance-based um, as, as a way of looking into standards. This de, de novo pathway, this is where new special controls are written uh, for mitigating risks um, and a new regulation is written. So a de novo would have, by definition, have no predicate device. Uh, and uh, so, as we discussed earlier, 98% of marketed sub market submissions to FDA are in the 510K or the pre-market notification. Um, and a positive result from FDA is substantial equivalence. Uh, so there's always a predicate device or device that your device would be compared to. And the predicate device has to be legally marketed uh, and not subject to a PMA, so it has to be a class two device. Uh, and the comparison, as I said, is uh, the, the uh, intended use and the technological characteristics. Um, if the intended use and the technological characteristics are the same, then a device would be substantially equivalent. If the technological characteristics are different um, and uh, and there are no new types of uh, questions regarding safety and effectiveness, then that device can also be found substantially equivalent. So, uh, so again, uh, uh, pre-market notification, you need to find a predicate device that's a legally marketed device uh, with the same intended use and the same technological characteristics, or if it technological characteristics are different, um, that the uh, your device, the new device, does not raise different questions of safety and effectiveness. That means questions that would not apply to the predicate device. Uh, so, for example, um, if you're looking at uh, electrical nerve stimulation and comparing it to ultrasound nerve stimulation, and if the questions have to do with safety. Um, it might be histopathic safety or functional safety. But if, if the questions are the same for electrical as they would be for ultrasound, um, then even though it's a new technology, you could still have a uh, finding of substantial equivalence uh, because the types of questions are the same. Um, and generally, uh, for 510Ks, you don't need clinical data, but you do need uh, test methods and data that support substantial equivalence. So uh, the first part, is the predicate device legally marketed? Um, and there are tens of thousands of cleared 510Ks, so there are many, many devices uh, that have cleared the 510K pathway. And any of those, or even combinations of those, can be used as, as predicates. Uh, and it's somewhat controversial, but even devices that are no longer on the market can be used uh, as, as predicate devices. Uh, devices granted a de novo can also be used as a predicate. So if a company um, has a new type of technology in class two that was granted a de novo, um, you could make a device that's substantially equivalent to that uh, device that was cleared by de novo, and that would be a 510K. Um, also, uh, devices that were on the market before 1976, before the medical device amendments took place, uh, I think there are very few of those still around, but technically uh, you can compare yourself to a uh, uh, pre-amendment device that's still on the market device uh, that's been on the market uh, before 1976. Or there, in some cases, there are devices that have gone uh, from class three to uh, class two uh, uh, down classified, and those can also be used as, as predicate devices. Uh, so the first part is uh, intended use. And the intended use is the general purpose of the device or its function. And it can include the indications for use. And the indications for use describe a disease or condition that the, the device will diagnose, treat, prevent, cure, or mitigate. 
Uh, and the indications also uh, need to have a patient population. So is, is your device appropriate for pediatrics? Is it appropriate for infants? Um, is it appropriate for uh, you know, a population that's over 65? Those all uh, are important uh, in determining uh, whether the intended use is the same. Uh, the technical characteristics, the technological characteristics, are given in a device description. And for predicate devices, you can almost always find a 510K summary on the FDA database, and you can see the technological characteristics of the predicate devices. Um, and if it's the same intended use and the same technological characteristics, then you're home. Then uh, there is, should be substantial equivalence. Uh, if the technological characteristics are different, uh, then it, it comes down to what types of questions uh, you would ask about safety and effectiveness. If the question for the predic the, the kinds of things that go on for the predicate device, the same questions apply to your device, uh, then uh, that's uh, that, that's. Uh, providing um, information showing uh, substantial equivalence. And FDA is responsible for um, identifying these questions. In your 510 application, you can uh, uh, anticipate some of this and uh, uh, show how the questions uh, for your device are, uh, are, are basically the same types of questions as for the predicate device. Uh, and uh, I have here uh, several websites you can look for uh, with the different types of uh, 510Ks. There's a traditional 510K, and uh, this is uh, one that uh, basically will compare your device to a predicate device. Uh, there's a special 510K. Uh, which usually involves some sort of minor change to a device. So the predicate device in that case would be your older device, the older model, and the uh, new one would be uh, the, your current model if there are just minor changes. Uh, there's an abbreviated 510K, and uh, abbreviated 510Ks rely heavily on uh, recognized standards. Uh, testing to these standards. Many types of devices have uh, standards uh, made by industry and FDA recognizes many of those standards. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, have a device cleared uh, based on the substantial equivalence based on uh, the predicate device and, uh, and using um, and testing according to standards. Uh, that's a convenient uh, pathway. Uh, there's also a new uh, safety and performance pathway uh, where there are performance standards, and this has been used uh, a lot in cardiovascular devices. And then there's the de novo, where there's no predicate device, but you d can demonstrate through uh, evidence, occasionally uh, clinical evidence and often clinical evidence, um, that uh, uh, there are special controls that can be written um, that uh, sh show your d device will be safe and effective. And uh, here are some questions about the 510K and pre-market notification. Uh, question eight, predicate devices listed in a 510K submission A are compared for technological characteristics and intended uses. B, must have been marketed before May 28, 1976. C, must have clinical data showing safety and effectiveness. D, can include class three devices. E, must be currently marketed. So this is questions about how to select a, a predicate. Uh, question nine is true or false. After de novo is approved, competitors can submit a 510K for substantial equivalence to the de novo device. Is that true or false? Uh, number 10, uh, true or false, after de novo application is granted, a new class regulation is published in the Code of Federal Regulations. Is that true or false? So in summary, uh, the 510K route is the most common 
uh, way FDA reviews medical devices. Uh, it applies to class two devices. Um, and the important two parts of uh, determining 510K are the same intended use as a uh, predicate device and the same technological characteristics or if the technological characteristics are different, no new questions that do not apply, that would not apply to the predicate device. Uh, there's also uh, uh, an allowance for testing according to standards where you can just cite the standards uh, and the tests that were done for those standards. So conformity with FDA recognized standards is often a big part of uh, the uh, uh, pre-market notification pathway. Uh, and lastly, for a class two, two device without a predicate, uh, you need to establish special controls. This topic is about the PMA or pre-market application process. Uh, in the previous section, we looked at the 510K process, which is the most prevalent way uh, FDA reviews new medical devices. Uh, pre-market approval is for the class three devices, and it involves actual uh, evaluation of uh, safety and effectiveness. And the law is for re a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness using scientific evidence. Uh, devices uh, through PMA are subject to inspections through their entire, uh, pretty much their entire life cycle. Um, very often there are external advisory panels uh, helping with the decision. Uh, there's often, uh, since safety and efficacy are never truly independent of one another, uh, there's a, a benefit-risk analysis that's done uh, often in, in PMAs. Uh, there are many PMA supplements. So once a device is approved, as that device evolves over years, uh, uh, further approval is done through the supplement process. And uh, some uh, prevalent devices, some of the devices we see often, have hundreds of supplements. So they, they could date back uh, to pre-market approval applications in the 80s or 1990s. Uh, there's also uh, federal preemption in state courts on product liability which is uh, an advantage to manufacturers in that uh, uh, PMA-approved device uh, is not uh, subject to state liability laws because of federal preemption. And uh, again, uh, it's about 1% of the devices go through the PMA process. So I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly through it uh, since it's, uh, uh, it's unlikely that uh, uh, you'll be doing a PMA. Uh, it's somewhat surprising to a lot of people that most devices uh, don't go through the D PMA process. Um, and uh, there was a uh, film recently uh, called The Bleeding Edge in which uh, Mike Carome, Dr. Mike Carome, who's director of the Health Research Group at the Public Citizen, uh, said that people are surprised. Uh, medical devices have under the people. Most people think that medical devices have undergone appropriate testing to ter determine whether they're safe and effective. Um, but that's not the case. And he goes on discusses the 510k pathway. Uh, so uh, it, it it is surprising. Um, what what he didn't say is that uh, m actually most devices are exempt, as, as we saw in the previous section. Uh, and uh, part of the uh, regulation uh, is that the agency has to rely on valid scientific evidence to determine whether there is a reasonable assurance that the device is safe and effective. So uh, valid scientific evidence is, uh, is part of the regulations that determine uh, PMA approvals. Uh, review uh, of PMAs once they're into FDA is a four-step process. Uh, first, there's a very limited review to make sure the PMA is complete, to make sure they're the necessary things that the agency needs to review the PMA. It's called a filing review or an administrative review. Uh, then there's an in-depth uh, review uh, by uh, 
uh, by the staff in uh, OPEC, in the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality. Uh, and uh, there are also inspections uh, that go on as, as part of the review process. Uh, you know, uh, for example, if you have clinical data to uh, look at uh, carefully at how the clinical data was was gathered, and uh, at, at the point where uh, inspectors do go to the uh, locations where these studies were done, uh, there's uh, for many PMAs, if it's a new kind of device, uh, FDA will convene a, an external review panel of experts and uh, hold a public meeting. And for some devices, this is the first view the public has of the device. Uh, FDA review uh, through this process is kept confidential uh, until the time of the, uh, of the panel meeting. And then there's finally final deliberations and notification by FDA, which usually follows a panel meeting after several months. Um, FDA can require post-approval studies as a condition for approval. And then, of course, I mentioned uh, 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 PMA supplements. Uh, interestingly, studies uh, that don't do well, studies that are, are, are not approved by FDA or withdrawn are kept confidential by FDA uh, unless they've been uh, discussed at a panel meeting or, of course, if, if the company discusses uh, these things. Uh, here's a, an example of a uh, PMA neurological device that uh, I was involved in uh, uh, in the late 1980s and uh, 1990s. Um, it's a deep brain stimulator uh, for tremor and then later for Parkinson's disease. Um, there's been a recent approval for epilepsy. And uh, there's a, a lot of not just the clinical study, but a lot of engineering and design analysis, uh, looking at materials, uh, looking at circuits, uh, animal studies. Uh, and this, the, these kinds of devices had earlier feasibility studies and then uh, um, the more pivotal clinical trial. So uh, we'll, we'll go through the questions now on the pre-market approval of PMA. Which of the following is a requirement in a PMA? A, two independent clinical studies showing safety and effectiveness. B, the proposed market price of the device. C, a comparative effectiveness analysis showing superiority to other treatments or diagnostics. D, a previous submission with FDA. E, proposed labeling of the device. Uh, true or false, a PMA supplement must have human data whenever a device change affects the safety and effectiveness. Okay, and in summary, uh, PMA is the most rigorous uh, way FDA approves medical devices. Uh, and uh, these are for the high-risk class 3 devices. Uh, uh, PMA requirements are, of, of course, the most rigorous and have to grant a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness based on valid scientific evidence, uh, usually a randomized control trial. The last thing I should mention is that uh, PMAs, once they're approved, uh, required to send an annual, there's a requirement for annual reporting of all new information uh, related to the device. This is topic six, and it's on investigational devices. And in order to use an investigational device in humans, uh, you need to, in, in, in the U.S., uh, uh, get it uh, approved by the FDA. And uh, in many cases, uh, the application is exempted from the FDA, but you still need to follow the general rules for, uh, uh, for, for human experimentation. Uh, the elements, and I'll just introduce the, the topic, the elements are informed consent, uh, human protections, of course, um, IRB approvals, uh, the Institutional Review Board, financial disclosure, and uh, listing in clinicaltrials.gov. So the, these are general rules about uh, that uh, you should always be following with uh, in, in doing human experimentation with devices. Um, I'll also talk about uh, when an IDE is not required, uh, and that's mainly for the non-significant risk studies, uh, 
studies in, in humans that don't uh, involve any significant risk to the study subject. And these very often are diagnostic devices, uh, diagnostic devices when they're not used in decision making, when they're just used in experimentation, are usually non-significant risk. I'll also talk about the reasons for FDA disapprovals, which uh, for the investigational device exemptions uh, have to do more with patient safety than the type of trial or, uh, or the, the level of evidence that the trial will yield. Uh, re there are reporting requirements with clinical trials, uh, in, in, you know, including adverse event reporting. Um, and before doing a trial, it's generally a good idea to have a pre-submission meeting with the, with the FDA, especially if it's a significant risk trial and there's going to be an IDE application. And um, uh, it's also possible to have FDA as almost as part of your team. Uh, one of the uh, charges of FDA is, uh, um, is innovation, encouraging innovation. Uh, and there's an early feasibility program where uh, FDA can uh, be in an early feasibility trials um, uh, in, in a very helpful way. Uh, this topic, I'm going to mainly talk about uh, the FDA part of this, the rules for investigational uh, device exemptions. Uh, Dr. Susan Alpert, uh, in two lectures from now, uh, will be discussing extensively uh, how to do clinical investigations. We'll have uh, a, a lot more uh, detail um, about the scientific part of uh, doing clinical trials. So uh, as uh, we go from uh, a medical device uh, to uh, uh, from experiments into uh, approval, uh, we saw before that the uh, different regulatory paths are complicated. I just want to take a small aside and show uh, how it's done with drugs. Uh, there's basically uh, a single path uh, that goes from basic research, um, preclinical development, to the IND, um, which uh, is for investigative new drugs, um, and that's to do the clinical trial with the, with the drugs. And there are generally three phases to these uh, trials, so three basically separate sets of trials. Uh, then once uh, those trials are done, then the company submits a new drug application or an NDA, uh, FDA review, and uh, et cetera. Uh, and drug trials, this process for a drug um, in, in this tally in 2016 took about 6.7 years on average and uh, $2.87 billion. So uh, uh, this is part of the reason uh, for the feed through uh, in investigations from small companies into larger companies because there aren't very many small companies that uh, can spend $2.87 billion in almost seven years. Uh, so this, uh, this, this is one of the things that's structured uh, the, the, the drug industry. Uh, for devices, as you remember, the pathways, as I said, are, uh, are, are more complex and they're risk-based. Uh, there's class one, the low-risk devices, uh, medium-risk devices, class two, and class three. And uh, according uh, to the Department of Commerce in the 2012 report, uh, there's uh, more than 6,500 medical device companies in the U.S., uh, that's a, a lot of uh, companies, and 80% have fewer than 50 employees. Uh, a, a large number I, I am familiar with have a, fewer than 10 employees. So, um, so the, the structure is, is different. Um, you do have some feed through to the larger companies, but uh, uh, generally the, the structure is, is uh, uh, much more focused on uh, uh, smaller innovative companies. And device trials for 510K um, usually takes about 10 months uh, to put together and, uh, um, and have a 510K cleared and about $4 million. Uh, for PMAs, it's, uh, it's larger because there's very often a uh, controlled clinical trial and that, and that figure is $94 million and 
four and a half years, but you can still see it's, um, it's, it's, it's a lot less than drugs. And if we look at uh, this uh, pyramid of uh, going uh, on, on the left side is kind of the commercial aspects where the, where the funds come from. On the, on the right side is uh, kind of the uh, regulatory aspects. Um, you start off uh, with uh, fundamental science and that's sponsored very often by NIH grants or small business grants and venture capital. It could be sponsored also by the Defense Department. Uh, and the, these are the fundamental science and non-clinical studies. Uh, but the important part of that is um, uh, taking care of the regulatory part, having good design controls. Why did you design the, the device a certain way? If you change the device, why did you uh, make that change? Uh, just basically keeping good notes of what was went on. And that's part of also for good laboratory practices as the experiments are being done. You know, why did you choose this animal model to, to study? Um, and uh, what, what are the relevance, advantages, and disadvantages of that animal model? Then finally, um, you need fairly significant um, investment if, if you see a product, or have a product, to go into the IDE process to do um, uh, investigations. And I've kind of divided investigations into um, uh, feasibility studies and then pivotal studies. Uh, and then at the end of the pivotal study, hopefully there'll be FDA approval or FDA clearance. Um, there'll be manufacturing of the device and uh, requirement for good manufacturing processes. Uh, and then there's the next step, and there's an, uh, a very good lecture on uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services on reimbursement, um, which uh, is key in, in the U.S. Is for, for most devices to have them. Um, reimbursed by insurance. Uh, then uh, as you, you move up, uh, you have commercialization. Then uh, um, in, in the field, uh, you, you start having comparative effectiveness studies, things in the medical literature, which are, um, you know, very important. Uh, it's not enough just to have something approved by FDA. It has to be uh, accepted uh, in, in, in the medical community. Uh, and that's where you start to get commercial return. And, and, and finally, at the top, you might have a uh, uh, meta-analysis showing uh, safety and, and effectiveness. And uh, that's uh, for a broadly disseminated device. Uh, so uh, investigational uh, studies are designed, uh, according to uh, law, to encourage the discovery and development uh, of new devices with the protection, and I highlighted the word protection, of the public health. Uh, so there's supposed to be optimum freedom for scientific investigations, and that was uh, kind of arrived at through uh, uh, the, the law, uh, the FIDESIA uh, revision in 2012, where uh, in order to allow optimum freedom, uh, the uh, um, FDA can only approve, disapprove a, an investigational device exemption uh, based on patient safety. Uh, we don't want, FDA uh, doesn't necessarily prescribe the types of studies that could be done, but uh, is there in the IDE phase to, uh, for patient protection. Uh, all uh, uh, studies in, in humans require IRB approvals um, uh, or exemptions from IRBs uh, and all studies uh, require uh, emergency I'm sorry, require sorry uh, uh, informed consent uh, and with a rare exception when there is emergency use uh, such as a defibrillator on an unconscious person uh, when no alternatives are available uh, and there are several parts of the code. Um, there's uh, the IDE uh, par part, and you can that's 21 CFR 812, uh, protections of human subjects, uh, financial disclosures, and uh, rules about the institutional review boards. That's uh, 21 CFR 56. Uh, 
Um, so the IDE regulations uh, 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 permits devices to be, once the IDE is approved, to be uh, shipped for clinical evaluation, uh, actually uh, uh, in, in the United States. Um, there, there's a whole other set of things if you depending on if you go to foreign countries for uh, studies how, how that's done uh, it I the uh, the uh, CFR also identifies exempted devices uh, and I'll talk about that more in a minute um, and also dis describes significant risk versus non-significant risk investigations. Um, and uh, also, uh, as, as I noted, uh, if, if you're doing an investigation, uh, it needs to be registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, this is true for FDA, but also uh, most journals that when you go to publish your, your work uh, will expect uh, the trial to have been listed. So uh, here's just a uh, uh, diagram. Um, there's device studies. Um, there are some studies that are exempt from, uh, from IDEs, and th those are studies uh, using devices, approved devices, according to approved uh, indications. So if you're using a device, an approved device or clear device, according to its label, uh, you don't need to, uh, to go through the IDE process, but of course you still need um, informed consent in the IRB. Uh, for the other devices, things, new devices, things that have not been approved, or an old device that's being used for new indication, uh, those can either be significant risk studies, and there are the full IDE requirements, which we'll go through, um, or a non-significant risk study uh, which means you follow the same rules, but you don't need to, uh, basically you don't need to submit an FDA application for a non-significant risk study. Um, generally, the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, will make the call about a significant risk or non-significant risk study. Um, also, uh, these proposed studies can be sent to FDA for a determination of, of ri significant risk. So um, FDA can actually be asked uh, whether study is non-significant risk or not. Here uh, uh, is, again, is the um, exam studies. So commercial devices used in accordance with labeling, uh, testing of consumer preference of a modification of a combination of devices when not determining safety and effectiveness and not putting subjects at risk. Of course, veterinary devices. Uh, custom devices, what, uh, this has a definition that it, it's basically um, if a physician customizes a device for a particular patient, you know, bends a tube to fit somebody's mouth, for example, uh, that, that doesn't need an uh, uh, IDE. Um, but of course you always need IRB approval and informed consent. The significant risk study pr presents a, a, a potential serious risk to health, safety, and welfare of a subject. Um, and uh, generally implants are almost all, I think always, but certainly almost always. I don't, can't think of any exceptions where an implanted, impl implanted device wouldn't be part of a significant risk study. Uh, any life supporting or life sustaining device. Um, and uh, th things that are important in treating diseases. Uh, so uh, these are uh, uh, significant risk devices. Um, and this, of course, needs the full IDE and FDA approval. Uh, the non-significant risk studies um, are many low-risk diagnostic devices, as long as in the study that diagnosis isn't going to control uh, the course of clinical treatment. Um, and there are specific examples that FDA uh, lists as uh, non-significant risk devices for studies. Um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, less than four Tesla, uh, electroencephalography, uh, functional electrical neuromuscular stimulators, transepithelial nerve stimulators, and ossicular uh, replacements. Um, so. Uh, 
the, if you're doing a study basically with an electroencephalogram or doing some MRI imaging, uh, that's likely to be a non-significant risk study. As, as, and that's true for many diagnostic devices, of course. Uh, informed consent, uh, and you, you'll hear more about this uh, two lectures from now, it must be reviewed by the IRB and FDA prior to use. That's if an IDE is required. Um, and there occasionally may be waived when there's life-threatening situations, uh, and that's the, the, the example of, let's say, of an unconscious per person uh, when there's no time and the subject cannot communicate. Uh, so when are clinical data needed? Uh, for class three devices, such as PMA or humanitarian device exemptions, are almost always needed. Uh, about 10% of 510Ks have clinical data in them. Um, and uh, a large number of de novos, uh, I think most, almost all the ones I've seen have uh, clinical uh, data in them. Uh, so, uh, and a new indication for an approved device uh, certainly needs uh, 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 a clinical study. Um, that would come in as a, uh, a P, usually as a PMA supplement. Um, significant change to device, device, especially class three device, uh, very, will very often need a clinical study. Uh, there is, uh, there, we can also think of clinical studies as being of two types. One is kind of a sponsor investigator, and th these are mainly research studies for, for physiology, um, not for commercial uh, purposes. And then there's the manufacturer-sponsored clinical study. Uh, these are the ones, devices that you know, are intended to come to market. And uh, we can divide those types of studies into um, uh, feasibility studies, pivotal studies, um, and, uh, uh, and post-approval studies. So going back to the sponsored investigator, it's, it's for basic physiological research. Uh, there's no intent to develop the device for marketing. So many university studies in, in, in physiology that might use a device to measure something or, or stimulate something, many of those devices, you know, you, you know using an off-the-shelf sh stimulator, um, uh, that, that's not intended for commercialization. Um, so there's no IDE needed, uh, and, uh, but IRB approval and informed consent, of course, are, are always needed. Uh, feasibility trial, uh, we think of as uh, something that can be done to test a uh, device in its earliest stages in, in humans. Um, and uh, the idea of early feasibility is it allows the device to be modified. It's, it's not the pivotal trial. So uh, uh, we want, by the time a device gets to a really critical trial, we want the device to be optim optimized. Um, so there's very often just preliminary safety data, usually no control group in a, uh, uh, in a feasibility trial, a uh, limited number of patients. And there is a program, uh, the Early Feasibility Studies Program, uh, and that puts together uh, investigators with an FDA team to help, uh, help with the study. And this is part of encouraging uh, innovation. And uh, many of you may have early feasibility studies. Uh, then is the so-called pivotal trial. Uh, that's the one, especially for PMAs, uh, but also for de novos and some of the 510Ks, uh, where you want the design to be finalized, the indications finalized. Uh, you usually want to propose some hypothesis and have control controls, uh, experimental controls, blinding, um, placebo controls if possible, which is can be a challenge, especially with devices. Um, you want to pre-specify endpoints, primary and secondary, um, and you want to use this trial to develop information for labeling. So, uh, if your device is approved or cleared, the information from your trial will be useful for labeling and you, of course you need it has to be scientifically valid including statistically um, to show safety and effectiveness uh, 
post-approval studies uh, may be required for as a conditional approval for FDA, and it's designed um, to address a specific question that didn't come up during the pre-market or the pre pivotal trial. Um, and um, very often, these post-approval trials can, can be registries of, of, of tracking uh, patients. Um, and CMS does reimburse for uh, IDE studies. Uh, and there's a CMS, I listed a uh, uh, website about that from CMS, the Center for Medicare Services. And there's several hundred IDEs uh, that uh, are identified by CMS, several hundred devices that are covered for experimental use. So um, normally experimental devices um, are, are not are, are, are not paid for, well, experimental devices can be paid for by the company. Um, they can also be paid for uh, by the patient or by a third party. And CMS, in order to encourage experimental devices that are uh, promising, uh, does this. And there is some uh, movement right now, it hasn't been solved yet, uh, for uh, when FDA uh, designates a breakthrough device for CMS to uh, automatically reimburse for anything FDA uh, considers a, a breakthrough device. That's under consideration right now. Uh, it's um, April and it hasn't, hasn't been done yet. Okay, so uh, for investigational device exemptions, we have some question. Um, a significant risk determination is made by A, the device investigator, B, the institutional review board, C, FDA upon request or uninitiated, D, either B or C. True or false, an investigation with an approved device used according to labeled instructions and indication requires an IDE submission. True or false. True or false, human trials that are exempt from IDE submissions still must meet IDE requirements. True or false, IDE investigations cannot be approved while device design is being developed. Okay, so in, in summary, this is a big topic because uh, uh, it's an important part of device development is doing the investigation. Um, uh, and uh, it's important to know uh, what the IDE regulations are. Uh, the, basically, FDA is there to assure patient safety and also uh, in, encourage in innovation. Um, and uh, IDE applications need not be submitted for when there are non-significant risk studies. Um, and there are some uh, studies that are, are exempt from the IDE regulations. Uh, for example, using an approved device according to its label. After your device is approved or cleared, this is topic seven. Um, FDA, uh, after an approval, may in certain instances uh, require post-approval study to answer specific questions that weren't answered during the approval. Uh, there could be uh, required post-market surveillance, uh, and this is something that FDA uh, can also uh, call for, um, especially if there have been uh, a number of adverse events or uh, some, qu some questions about uh, safety and effectiveness. Uh, there's always a requirement for all classes of devices to report adverse events and uh, we'll talk about the MAUD database a little bit. Uh, there's annual reporting. Uh, if you have an approved PMA, you're required to uh, submit an annual report uh, on, the, on the work and uh, on the experience and on the field in general uh, in, in your uh, PMA annual report. And there are uh, device recalls, and those very often involve defective uh, or when uh, devices can present a, a risk to people. Uh, Post-approval studies, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there are 258 of them between 2001 and 2020. Uh, these were required by FDA uh, uh, for, uh, to answer 
uh, questions about the original approval that weren't in the initial study. Um, uh, and then there are required or what's called Section 422 studies. Um, this is when FDA can um, require a uh, study. Uh, and uh, there are 29 of these studies between 2011 and 2020. And this is, uh, th these are very often the devices you may hear, hear about in headlines when there's uh, questions and F FDA needs to find out the uh, answers about safety and effectiveness. Um, and these studies can also uh, include patient registries, which is uh, very often an effective way uh, of doing a, a post-approval study. Uh, medical device uh, reporting goes through the MAUD system. That stands for Manufacture and Use of Facility Device Experiencing Experience. Uh, so uh, you need, it, what, no, what, no matter what your device is, if uh, it may have caused or contributed to a death or serious injury, that you need to report that to the FDA. Um, or if the device malfunctioned in a way that was likely to contribute to a death or serious injury. Um, CDRH receives over a million uh, medical device reports per year. Um, and manufacturers, as I mentioned, must uh, send those reports. There are also voluntary reports, uh, including from patients and consumers and healthcare professionals. Um, and you can look at that. You can find that on MedWatch if you ever want to report uh, an event from a medical device. Um, it's open to anyone. Um, and then there is something called alternative summary reporting. Uh, some For some devices selected by FDA, um, they don't need to submit each separate report, but can uh, uh, put, uh, in, in, put it all into a summary table. Uh, and there's uh, the MAUD database, which is uh, searchable. And uh, uh, I encourage... Uh, if you're thinking about a device, you could find similar devices and see what the adverse events were. Um, and you see these adverse events, and uh, it, it may help you in, in designing or, uh, or, or labeling your device to know where things have gone wrong. Uh, and we'll talk more about uh, how, how to search for these things uh, in uh, the next section. Uh, medical device recalls, uh, un unfortunately, and there are different types of recalls. Um, they're usually classified and, and it goes the opposite of device cla classification where a class one recall is the most serious. Uh, these very often uh, are uh, involve a death or, or serious injury. So when there's a, uh, a reasonable chance that the product will cause a death or serious injury, then there's the type of recall is, is class one. Uh, and class two recall is a slight chance. Uh, and a class three recall is more, uh, will usually involve an adjustment or correction. So um, uh, th this is something that uh, once a device is on the market, uh, you'll, you become familiar with and, uh, and, and see how it works. Uh, recall is announced publicly by FDA and everyone uh, finds out about it at the same time, including physicians, patients, uh, liability lawyers, uh, shareholders, uh, and, uh, and there are obvious reasons that uh, the report has to be made public uh, uh, by FDA simultaneously to everyone. Um, and uh, there can be complex, with recalls, it can be complex decisions to be made. Some of them are simple. If, uh, if a device is on the shelf, it can be removed from the shelf. Uh, sometimes it's um, just uh, reprogramming an, an update uh, to the software of a device. Uh, sometimes there are question about, questions about explanting a device, and their risk benefit is very important because uh, there's... Um, there could be a risk to surgical explantation. And there's, of course, a uh, database of, uh, uh, of recalls from FDA. So here are questions for this section about uh, post-market. Um, a medical device report, MDR, must be filed with FDA by the manufacturer 
A, only for class three devices, B, only when there is evidence of a device malfunction, C, when the device may have caused or contributed to a death or serious injury, D, when there are manufacturing changes. Next question is true or false. FDA, FDA announces device recalls to physicians first. Number 19, a registry, and this is true or false, a registry including patients receiving an approved device may be part of a post-approval study. True or false? Okay, so uh, device uh, post-market studies um, uh, involve, uh, 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 occur after a device is approved. Uh, they may be required uh, uh, to answer questions, or they may be required continually. Um, and any reports of death uh, or serious malfunctions must be sent to FDA. And um, recalls are initiated by industry with notification and review from, from FDA. This is topic eight, and in this section, we're gonna talk about how to prepare for FDA. We've already reviewed the different pathways to marketing, uh, investigational device exemptions or how to uh, uh, use a device experimentally in humans uh, and what's required after a device is approved. So we've pretty much covered uh, most of, of what is done as far as medical devices by FDA. Uh, now we're going to look in some detail at uh, how you can find out things about the devices. Uh, FDA is good at uh, making information available. Uh, the bad part is that it's in, in located in several different places. There are a number of databases. Uh, so it's, it's good to have some idea of where to search. And that's uh, kind of the focus of this uh, topic. Uh, where to look. So the first place, uh, if you're planning a device, uh, you can see uh, if your device is already uh, there. Uh, there is what's called the Global Unique Device Identification Database. It's run by the National Library of Medicine and FDA. It's called GUDID, G-U-D-I-D. And uh, that, that's the first place I, I could, uh, would advise to search for your device. And there's uh, lots of information there, including device descriptions. FDA has approximately 12 uh, databases. Uh, it's on um, uh, a Access FDA um, and uh, for different topics, uh, for PMAs, for 510Ks, for de novos, uh, uh, databases for recalls, for uh, uh, medical device reports. So uh, these, these are, uh, they're, they're, there's a number of them. Um, the first place, the first place I would start is the database on device classification. So you can see in the Code of Federal Regulations how your device is uh, classified. Um, you can also FDA for uh, 510Ks has uh, a 510K summary, um, and particularly the recent ones are, are very good in that they tell you what information was used. Uh, for the decision of substantial equivalence. So you can uh, look at that summary and uh, that summary in itself actually serves as very good guidance for how you would uh, you might want to do your device. Uh, PMAs always have a um, fairly extensive summary of safety and effectiveness data. Uh, these are often uh, over 100 pages, including uh, details of the clinical studies and de details of device testing. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, there's that. So if you have a, uh, a device that's similar to something that's uh, a PMA device or a 510K device, you can actually see uh, the basis for FDA decisions on those. Uh, for uh, PMAs, you can also, if there was a uh, panel meeting, uh, you can actually look at the minutes for the panel uh, where uh, the company discusses this device and FDA reviewers also discuss the device. And sometimes these are in video format. 
Um, and um, it gives you, listening or, or reading these gives you a lot of insight into the, the kind of thinking that goes on uh, in making the decisions. Uh, there's also a database of uh, FDA recognized industry standards. Uh, these, these are uh, uh, useful for 510k submissions, particularly where you can conform to a standard and, uh, and, and, and basically just uh, confirm that you can conform to that standard. Um, FDA puts out guidance documents, so there's a guidance document database. Uh, with uh, the guidances or suggestions uh, that uh, are uh, intended to be helpful uh, for uh, submitting uh, things to FDA for submitting your 510k or your or your PMA or your IDE, um, and you can also, as I mentioned, uh, look for uh, look at the device uh, recall, see why devices have been recalled. Also, look at adverse events, what the adverse events are that might be related to your device. So uh, what you need to do is um, develop uh, a regulatory strategy uh, first uh, based on the, the class of your device um, and, uh, and your, your business needs. There might be, uh, for example, a PMA device, um, if there's a choice, might, might give you more market exclusivity, but the, the bar of uh, achieving approval is much higher. Uh, uh, and FDA is available for pre-submission meetings. So if you, especially with a new type of device or, or, unique, or a unique type of clinical study, um, it's, it's a good idea to prepare for a meeting with FDA uh, and uh, uh, explain your plans, but also uh, importantly give FDA uh, a chance to speak and uh, and, and discuss uh, uh, the review, have the reviewers discuss their ideas. Uh, these pre-submission meetings are uh, are non-binding. They're uh, meant to be more advisory and uh, and at, at times they can be friendly. So uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the more prepared you are and the more you understand uh, what FDA does. I, I think. Uh, uh, the happier the outcomes from, from these meetings. So here's uh, an, an example of uh, uh, something from the uh, search for GUDID from Global Unique Device Identification Database. Um, there are a number of things you can, um, uh, the information it'll give you, um, it'll, it'll tell you what the FDA product code uh, the three-letter FDA product code is uh, very essential, for, especially for searching the FDA databases. Uh, it'll give you a good description of the device, um, and it's, it's, it's global, um, and there's, there's a lot of information in there. Um, I think the one I have up here is a, uh, uh, for a deep brain stimulator and the device description of what a deep brain stimulator is. Uh, in looking at the um, regulations for classing uh, cla that are used to classify devices, uh, here's one for an electroencephalograph device. So, and the regulation uh, identifies the device, the class, and, and the panel. So, an EEG device is class two, and the panel is uh, uh, neurological devices, um, and it describes the uh, it describes the device in a little bit of detail. Uh, and as I said before, a, a big part of do, searching the FDA uh, databases, and there are many of them, the tw I counted 12, uh, look for product codes. It's a three-letter code that FDA creates, um, and it's used uh, by FDA to track devices, to track adverse events, um, and uh, to you can find requirements with product codes, um, and uh, and it's just a much easier way of, of, of searching. Um, and uh, Gooded uh, uh, also uh, gives you a device product code, which is very convenient. Uh, and here's an example of product codes. Uh, I mentioned the regulation for um, uh, the electroencephalograph devices, 21 CFR 882-1400, uh, 
And there's a, there's a bunch of different uh, products associated with electroencephalograph devices. Uh, the most prevalent one with 279 510Ks is uh, GWQ, or the full montage standard electroencephalograph. This is kind of the familiar uh, device. Uh, and, but there's others, there's uh, uh, other prevalent ones. There's OLT, which is uh, quantitative EEG software. Uh, uh, and there's uh, others that are software involved. Uh, there's uh, some that are done for polysomnography for sleep studies um, that, that has a, a different product code. So, uh, so find out uh, if you have a device that's similar or fits one of these product codes, find out the product code and that will uh, make it a lot easier to search FDA. And here's uh, the product code GWQ. Uh, this is the full montage uh, electroencephalograph and it identifies the device, um, tells you the reviewing office, tells you the submission type, which is a 510K, uh, the class of the device, and it also nicely shows you what the FDA recognized standards are for this device. So if you test to these standards, you can save uh, a, a lot of time in your FDA application um, by certifying uh, what, what, the, what standards you've tested for and any exceptions, of course, to those tests. Uh, here's another uh, um, product code. It's in, in, it's in a different uh, regulation and biofeedback devices. Uh, this defines a biofeedback device. Uh, it identifies it, uh, provides visual auditory signal corresponding to the status of one or more of a patient's physiological parameters. It could be brain waves, uh, muscle activity, skin temperature. So the patient control, can control voluntarily these physiological parameters. What's interesting is if you look at Part B, it says it's class 2, which you, you'd expect. But it also tells you it's exempt from pre-market notification um, when it's a prescription battery power device and it's indicated for relaxation training and muscle re-education. So if you have uh, a, a device such as this one, um, you know, for, for training a muscle um, or for, uh, you know, in, inducing um, an alpha wave rhythm that's relaxing, let's say, and it's battery powered, uh, then uh, you're, you're, it's an exempt device even though it's class two. Uh, for pre-submission meetings and FDA jargon, uh, these are called Q-subs or Q-submissions. Uh, it's just based on the letter that goes with uh, the document, uh, P was already taken for PMA, uh, so Q is, uh, is as good a letter as any. Uh, uh, and it lets, gives you a meeting with FDA for FDA reviewers to discuss the regulatory aspects of your work, and it's essential to do your homework um, and, of course, decide whether the meeting will be helpful for you at the stage. Uh, I, don't think it's usually helpful if you haven't don't have some sort of plan in mind. If if you're just going to get general information, there are other ways to get general information. Uh, and your regulatory plan. Remember, uh, FDA has to find uh, the least burdensome path to market, and if, and of course your regulatory plan should take that into account as well. Um, and these meetings are suggested for new investigational ex device exemptions, um, almost any class three device, uh, major supplements, and de novos. Uh, for the 510Ks, maybe, but not, I would say not usually, because the 510K is substantial equivalence unless there are some uh, important questions about the 510K that, um, are, where the answers don't seem obvious. Um, and remember, at these meetings, review team members change, so uh, these meetings aren't binding. So uh, if you hear one reviewer's opinion, uh, you may come back in, after your IDE study in two and a half years and have a completely different set of reviewers. Um, and uh, of course, uh, g given the complexity of FDA regulation, there's a lot of jargon and a lot of requirements. Uh, but uh, but the, these are all learnable, so don't be intimidated by them. Um, 
and stay positive, always uh, 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 and, and uh, summarize what at these meetings what you've heard from FDA to make sure um, that uh, it's clear. Um, and after the meeting, you're, uh, there's usually a lead reviewer assigned, um, and you should maintain contact, some sort of contact with the lead reviewer. Uh, and there's a FDA has a pre-submission guidance that says some of the things that I'm saying and probably more. So on uh, uh, meeting with FDA and get preparing for FDA, some questions. Exceptions from 510K notification are listed in the Code of Federal Regulations. Is that true or false? True or false. FDA guidance documents set forth new requirements for device emissions that go beyond regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations. True or false? Selecting a least burdensome regulatory approach when two regulatory paths are available is a requirement for FDA. Is that true or false? Also true or false. It is usually beneficial to have a pre-submission with FDA before researching a regulatory plan. Is that true or false? Anyway, so this is an uh, uh, important topic, uh, although brief. Uh, there's a lot of information on FDA databases, and you can use that to develop uh, a regulatory plan. Um, there are uh, approved devices, there are clear devices, and there are, you know, for the clear devices, there are literally tens of thousands of them that uh, you, you might find something for substantial equivalence. Uh, and uh, a pre-sub meeting with the FDA may be useful uh, to introduce your application and receive um, early feedback from FDA. Uh, this is the final topic we'll be covering today. Uh, it's on special programs at CDRH. Uh, We've already covered all the regulatory paths, investigational devices, post-approval, um, and how to look at FDA databases. Um, and there are some special programs that, are, uh, that overlap in these areas that, that you might be interested in. Uh, first of all, um, CDRH uh, does research, uh, both laboratory and epidemiological research, um, and it's possible uh, to collaborate uh, with CDRH in a formal way. So you can actually have FDA as a collaborator. Um, and the, the point of these collaborations is, uh, is, is to benefit uh, the, the regulatory work of FDA uh, and, and help uh, uh, better device regulation in, in the country. So, so generally these are um, uh, studies that are um, er everything publishable uh, and of, of general benefit. Uh, they're not there just to help you with your, your device, but uh, of, of general benefit. Uh, and there's also, um, in, in thinking about this, there's a Medical Device Innovation Consortium, which is a public-private partnership um, between industry and FDA. Um, and they also take up areas of, uh, 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 of research, and uh, um, they're linked to both FDA and industry. Uh, part of the uh, MDIC is the National Evaluation System for Health Technology Coordinating Center. And uh, this group uh, uh, officiates, oh, well, not officiates, but it, uh, it's in charge of real-world um, studies uh, for regulatory purposes. So if you have, uh, uh, if you think there's real world evidence um, that would be helpful for understanding a device, either one that's on the market or, uh, or uh, a, a new indication, for example, using off-label data, um, that might be a topic to propose to uh, Nest CC. Um, and they have um, expertise, uh, uh, formidable expertise in using this type of evidence. Um, FDA also has medical device development tools, and those are biomarkers or assessments. Um, and uh, and so you, if you have a new uh, measurement method that might tell you how well a device is doing, that might be used to assess safety or effectiveness. Um, you can propose uh, this uh, to FDA as well. 
Uh, as of now, there are 10 of these medical device development tools um, that, that, that are being studied. Um, there's a breakthrough devices program, which I mentioned earlier. FDA can designate a device uh, as a breakthrough device following the QSUB or pre-submission process. So um, you can have your device uh, be designated as a breakthrough device uh, before it's even approved. Um, and there's, a, of course, a guidance document on that uh, that you can link to. Uh, for things that uh, aren't necessarily breakthroughs, but uh, uh, incremental improvements in safety. There's also the STEP program, which is Safer Technologies program, um, and a, another way of uh, interacting uh, with, with FDA and, uh, um, and hopefully getting uh, uh, the, the kind of encouragement and uh, notoriety uh, that a, a good device would uh, deserve. Um, there's uh, a, a lot going on in the world of uh, digital health, uh, such as mobile apps, uh, artificial intelligence, is the guidance on this. Um, and there's a special part of the center devoted towards uh, digital health uh, that, can, that can help you uh, navigate uh, how digital health is being regulated. Uh, as also, as we mentioned, there are early feasibility studies um, it's a way of including uh, FDA uh, as part, almost as part of a team for early feasibility studies as a device is being developed. And also, uh, I, I should mention that there's an appeals program at, at FDA. Uh, if, if you're unhappy with an FDA decision, you don't, you don't think it was right, and you have you know, re reasons for, for not thinking it's right, um, it can be appealed at the next supervisory level. Um, and uh, there's an ombudsman who can also assist with that. Um, and there's uh, a guidance. And, and sometimes these appeals go through many supervisory levels. Okay, so uh, for this uh, final topic, uh, here, here are some questions. Uh, true or false? A research collaboration agreement between a device manufacturer and researcher can be used to develop new ways of assessing device safety and effectiveness. True or false? True or false? Breakthrough device designation removes some regulatory requirements. Okay, again, um, FDA encourages interaction. There are many parts of the center that are set up uh, uh, to foster interaction. And uh, uh, these uh, interactions don't obviate any of the, uh, the regulations. Um, so uh, the, these, these programs are, are optional. Okay, so uh, in reviewing uh, today's presentation, uh, the, the main takeaways are that um, FDA regulates the safety and effectiveness of products and promotes innovation. Uh, the requirements are in the Code of Federal Regulations. There are guidance documents and special programs that make things helpful and make suggestions. Um, the device uh, system has three classes based on risk. Uh, class one devices, the lowest risk, and they're usually exempt from FDA application. Uh, class two devices uh, have the 510K application process, and they make up 98% of the marketing submissions uh, in FDA. Class three is about one, and those are the highest risk uh, devices. Uh, investigational devices need to follow the investigational device exemption rules. Um, and device regulatory strategies at early stages uh, should be made as the devices are innovated. Uh, the uh, regulatory part should be built in as, as you're developing and building your device. And there's, uh, uh, I briefly touched on a, a lot of uh, significant areas in the, in the last hour and a half. Uh, there are other lot, uh, learning opportunities. Uh, CDRH Learn um, has hours and hours of uh, of videos and, and materials 
on all aspects of uh, medical device uh, regulation. I, I encourage you to go to that website. Um, and um, if there is anything that you need to know or, uh, uh, or, or need to know more about, uh, there, there's probably uh, a good lecture or uh, group discussion of, of those topics. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the, one of the leaders of the course, uh, Dr. Welly, who was uh, formerly at FDA, and thank her for bringing this course to life. Um, Madras uh, Kennard, also a former colleague at FDA, um, for uh, her work on, uh, uh, on FDA post-market databases and on uh, introducing a lot of things to me on the GUDA database. And um, Susan Alpert for reviewing this talk and uh, suggestions um, as they relate to uh, her upcoming talk on uh, clinical trials. Anyway, uh, good luck on uh, getting your device ready for FDA. Um, don't be intimidated. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, it generally goes well. Thank you. <laughs>